answered. Well, I'd like to welcome you here. Um, my name is Nicholas Kristoff. I'm a columnist from the New York Times. And I, this is an unusual session in a couple of ways. But first of all, I want to kind of give a, um, a, a bit of a PG warning. And the reason is that um, we realized as we walked in that uh, the topic, it, it says, uh, design your cause. And so I think some of you may be here to figure out how to design your own cause or, or promote it. And uh, <laughs> this emerged because um, Julia Lalha Maharaj designed her cause, which happened to be female genital mutilation. So as a result, this panel is about uh, a discussion of where we go and how we deal with female genital mutilation. We didn't want to have a lot of people wincing in the audience if you were expecting a discussion about um, you know, how, how one goes about designing your cause. So fair warning. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, this is unusual in that respect, that you know, we associate Davos with turgid discussions of interest rates and Middle East policy and whatever, not particularly about genital cutting. Um, the other way in which this is most unusual is that this topic arose from a YouTube audience. And we've talked all the time about the importance of social media, how we can build campaigns. Well, this is an embodiment of precisely that. And uh, if you are here in the room, of course, please turn off your cell phones. If you are at home watching on YouTube, then turn on your cell phones really loudly um, <laughs> and just hit pause. Um, um, as I said, this topic arose because uh, people on YouTube were invited to vote among some competing ideas, some competing causes. And Julia Lala Maharaj, you want to there's, you wanna raise your hand there? Um, uh, Julia submitted a video which uh, explains her, her passion, uh, her cause, and let's cut to that now. Last year, I volunteered in Ethiopia, and one of the things I saw there, female genital mutilation, has completely changed the path of my life. I realized I couldn't look away from this urgent issue. So I came back to London and volunteered with an organization. And a friend sent me a link to the YouTube debates saying someone with an urgent human rights cause had to go to Davos. And I thought, this has got to be it. So why send me to Davos? Because I want to ask those innovative and intrepid world leaders to put their hearts and minds and power behind ending FGM. I've just found out that I am going to Davos. Since I won, I've been doing a video diary every day and really just trying to raise awareness about the basics of this very complex issue. So what is FGM? It's very simply the removal of a girl's external genitals, the clitoris, the labia, and in severe cases, the wound that's left is sewn up, so there's only a tiny hole left. I'm just pleased the day is here, actually, because there's been a lot of prep to get to this point. It's night one in Davos, and as you can see, it's absolutely beautiful. My belief is that issues like this can't stay on the margins that they really have to be debated at the highest levels. I'll follow up. Bless you. I'm really delighted I entered this competition. Who would have thought 10 days later I would go from my kitchen table to Davos? 
But let's not be complacent. This is just a few days at Davos. There's so much more to be done. There are still three million girls a year being cut. So what can we do together today to help do something about this? Hats off to Julia on that, and fair warning, as you can see, she may well buttonhole you uh, in the room and, uh, and try to get you to, to uh, join the movement. Um, I also think it's really quite extraordinary that considering all the causes out there, that the YouTube audience, a large audience, chose this one as the foremost issue that they wanted to address. And I think, in a larger sense, it does reflect the degree to which uh, the rights of women and girls around the world are rising on the agenda. Um, but um, Julia, I wonder if, you could, if we could just start off by maybe just addressing this question of, you know, given all the concerns that we have uh, around the world, whether on the human rights front or on the environmental front, economic front, why do you think this one is the one that should rise to the top, and why indeed did the, did, did, uh, the YouTube generation, which is maybe more your generation than mine, alas, uh, uh, sign up for it? You know, I think it just really caught people's hearts and minds. And actually, it has languished in that box that we all tick that says, this is too difficult. This is a taboo area. This is something that we didn't know about. And as a result, I think just coming out and saying three million girls a year are still being cut. Uh, people just caught on to that. And a lot of the comments on YouTube actually said, we didn't realize this still happened. And I think just bringing it out in that way. And also, you know, what was wonderful was people could go very instantly and look at clips about FGM in far more detail. So using social media in that way, actually allowing people to inform themselves about what the issue was, I think, you know, just created this, this tidal wave of interest. We have a terrific panel um, and indeed a lot of questions that have been submitted by... Uh, YouTube uh, viewers, and we'll also, um, you know, invite your comments and, and questions as well. Um, here on my left beside me is Kathy Calvin, who's the uh, head of the UN Foundation, which has been very involved in this issue. Uh, beside her, Larry Cox, who is the head of Amnesty International, the executive director of Amnesty, uh, which has likewise been involved in uh, this as a, as a central human rights issue. Uh, and uh, Anne Veneman, the uh, director, uh, executive director of UNICEF, which um, has uh, both gathered the data on this, the three million figure annually in Africa alone, figure that, uh, that Julia cited, and has also uh, been very active in supporting one of the ventures in uh, Senegal, Tostan, that has been most effective in, uh, in really seeing progress against uh, this. But Kathy, let me maybe start with you. Um, you know, is indeed one of the problems that this does feel like a taboo topic, that, you know, it always seems to me that AIDS, so many more millions of people died of AIDS because it involved sex and it was hard to talk about. Is the problem here that it involves genitals and so it's something that it's very hard to have a serious conversation about? You know, I actually think it's not a hard subject to have a conversation about and that Julia said the right thing. I don't think people really understand that it still exists. It sort of is one of those things that we heard about in our childhood, and we don't hear enough about it today. So I, my, my hat is off to Julia for bringing this back up front and center. I think the other reason we don't hear as much about it is it's about girls. And we don't really have an understanding of the life of 600 million girls around the world, that they don't get to stay in school, they get married off early, they're subject to genital mutilation. Their lives are challenging in ways that American girls don't really understand. And when they hear about it, they're shocked, they think it's unfair, and they want to do something. So yes, there's probably something about, ooh, now how do we talk about this? I frankly think reproductive health is just as difficult to talk about, especially when it comes to girls. But increasingly people, <coughs> I heard Melinda Gates yesterday speaking out about it, it's time to deal with these issues. And so here we are. Larry, um, one, uh, I, I had a conversation once with a Sudanese Daya, a woman who, who does the cutting. And, uh, I pushed her on general cutting, and she said, this is our culture. This is our religion. What business is it of you Americans whether we circumcise our daughters? 
How do we, how do we answer her? Well, that's a very important question. And when Amnesty started working on this several decades ago, it was a question that actually for a while even divided <laughs> our, own, our own membership. People were very afraid that they were being culturally insensitive or even imperialistic in, in taking this on. I think what makes the difference is hearing the voices of the actual women who experience this and who are fighting against it. Now then it becomes clear it's not a question, who defines the culture and how does culture change? Culture is not something stagnant. Uh, of course, it's easy for us to say, uh, you know, human rights uh, always trump culture. It's also interesting that these cultural arguments are usually um, not always used to justify cruelty uh, and pain that affect women and not men. I think if men were being cut in this way, uh, somehow the cultural arguments would fade away. But I think it is very important uh, to, A, listen to, 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 the, uh, to the women themselves, make their voices heard, because that completely undercuts the argument that this is something being imposed uh, from abroad. It's not. And secondly, I think it is important to take uh, the cultural argument seriously in the sense that to end the practice, one has to really seriously address how you get the whole community to understand uh, that this is something which is not in the interest of the community, not in the interest of the girls they care about, uh, and uh, to take the lead, in fact, in, in trying to, to stop it. The, uh, let me, um, uh, Anne, um, let me sort of follow up on that in the sense that this is something that the West has pushed hard against, really since the 1920s. I think um, because of British uh, influence, uh, Sudan banned, Infibulation, which is the worst kind of FGM back in 1925 and similar period in Kenya. And in fact, it really led in those, especially in those early periods, to something of a backlash. And uh, there was this sense of these outside imperialists telling us what to do, this is our culture. So Anne, if you could maybe talk a little bit about, I mean, is it fair to say that, uh, especially since the 1970s, when there was a ramped up effort, that that effort really didn't, uh, that it really was something of a failure, I mean, that, which is my view, but that now, in the last 10 years or so, we're kind of getting the formula for what works? Yeah, I think um, part of the problem is, as you say, that people react to having them, having them, their cultures, you know, uh, said that, that they're, they're not right. So, as Nick mentioned, one of the organizations that has been very successful is an organization called TOSTAN, T-O-S-T-A-N, for those of you who want to look it up on the web. Um, it works primarily in West Africa, but also across the band of Africa where uh, this practice is most prevalent. But I think the important thing about it is, is that it starts at the community level with community discussions. One of the first things that they did was they no longer refer to it as female genital mutilation because the word mutilation is judgmental, the word cutting is factual. This came about with conversations um, with the leadership of the communities themselves. I visited the first community that Tostan began in. And they started by talking with the imam, the senior leader. This was a community where men and women were so separated that the women literally had to walk in a different part of the whole community if the men were sitting in the town square. There was absolutely no mixing of men and women. So they began with the imam to talk about the health impacts. And suddenly the lights go on and say, well, yes, I remember my niece went a little crazy after this because of infection. Well, they had never put the health uh, impacts really on the agenda. So then they began to talk about it as a human rights issue. The, the, the community now has come together, men and women, not only has this practice, um, they've abandoned it as a community, but they've also seen that the education rates have gone up, the access to healthcare has gone up, um, better access for women to reproductive health services and attended births. So there's been a lot of impacts of working together as a community. Now, the other thing that they found, again, a cultural aspect, is you couldn't just do it in one community. And so you had to reach out to the other communities because the question was, if my daughter 
is not cut, she won't be able to get married because it's a cultural expectation. And so they had to begin to work in groups of communities to really get impact on this practice. Now, there are over 4,000 communities now in Senegal that have abandoned as a result of this community-based approach. And so I think we now know what the formula is that works. And just to push a little harder, I mean, is it fair to say that the uh, previous campaign, really since the 1970s, these laws passed, conferences held. Uh, I was in Guinea uh, last year where uh, FGM is punishable by life imprisonment on the part of the parents, or in some cases, uh, if the girl dies, actually by execution, and yet 99% of Ghanaian girls are still cut. Uh, I mean, given the need to learn from mistakes, is it fair to say that that long campaign, uh, until the more community-based approach of Toastan, really is a failure that we should learn from? And I'll toss it out to anybody, whether, I don't mean to subject <laughs> Anne to, <laughs> to, to, to this, but, I mean, you're welcome to address that, Anne, or anybody else can jump in. I, I think, I mean, I think this is, this is one of the consequences, is that, um, you know, people don't want to be told what to do, particularly when they believe it's part of their culture that's, that has been around for generations. On the other hand, one of the countries with the highest prevalence of uh, female genital cutting is Egypt. And they have, particularly with some of the women in the country speaking out themselves, some of the local women, some of the leaders, including the First Lady, speaking out on these issues, they're finding that they can have an impact, particularly as more and more women get access, or more and more families get access to television. So they can address some of these issues on things like soap operas or other ways of communicating with women on television to begin a little bit more dialogue about whether or not this is really something that has to be continued in the culture or whether or not it can be changed. And I think as well, Nick, the, the absolute importance of a multi-level approach. So the community grassroots level work is absolutely vital, but unless, as you say, the legislation is there, unless legislation is enforced, unless there's allied advocacy and media campaigns coming in to tell people about the changes in law. Um, recently, Uganda outlawed FGM, but there's a criticism there that government's done very little to actually tell people within Uganda that it's illegal. So you, you need an approach across the board that is there to reinforce this message. And Julia, there's a, a question here that um, from a, a YouTube viewer, um, uh, and I wondered if you could answer it while raising some of the, the consequences of Jeff, the practical consequences uh, in terms of health, sexuality, whatever it may be. The, uh, Mitch from London says, if you could spend five minutes with the grandmother of a girl that was about to be cut, presumably the grandmother being, the assumption is the grandmother is a decision maker there. Uh, if you could spend five minutes with the grandmother of a girl that was about to be cut, what would you say? You know, the first thing I would do and is... And actually, if maybe let's pretend Mitch didn't say five minutes. Let's say okay. one minute. <laughs> Um, okay, not five minutes. Um, actually, first of all, I'd listen. I'm, I'm volunteering in this area, and I know, uh, as Larry was talking about, this charge of cultural imperialism coming in, changing communities. I cannot sit in front of a grandmother and leap in and tell her why this is wrong. Um, but what I can do is talk about health impacts. As Anne said, the causal links between what happens in FGM and then the constant infections, the sepsis, the childbirth complications, everything that results are not known, often because the girls are cut at such a young age. So they don't realize that the impacts that this has. And in fact, many circumcisers are the greatest advocates within their own community to say why this must end once they've seen it. Larry, um, your, you and your organization are obviously focused on human rights, and if a, um, I mean, what, has the human rights community been sort of slow to look, to focus on some of these broad issues that involve every home? In other words, if a, uh, if a Sudanese dissident gets arrested by the government, uh, then obviously everybody writes letters. If uh, three million girls a year get cut, then you know whether it's 
organizations, whether it's we in the media, uh, everybody, that people kind of tune out. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we have been too slow, and uh, it's a sort of painful history to have to look at uh, to understand uh, not only the importance of this issue, but the important general uh, of, uh, of uh, the rights of women as key uh, not only uh, to, to women, but to, in fact, the advancement of all human rights. And it really was the women's movement uh, that pushed the human rights community to, to begin to understand this. Uh, and as it did, our work on all human rights began to improve because the lessons that you've learned about the, uh, FGM are lessons that in fact apply to other human rights violations as well, that you have to work with the community, that you have to understand, you have to listen, that you have to empower the people uh, who are there. And you also understand that in this issue, it's not simply a question of, of, of uh, this issue separate from the larger issue of violence against women and the larger issue of the devaluation of women, of the discrimination against women. I don't think you can really solve, and, and Tostan certainly <laughs> took this approach. The reason it adopted a human rights approach was because human rights speak across the board. They, uh, has, it's a holistic vision of what people need. It's not just issue-oriented, but it's issued on what the basic rights that everyone needs. And when it did that, the community began to understand this not as an isolated cultural practice that everyone condemned, but as part of a general uh, fight for, for the human rights of everybody in the community. Uh, and I think that made a difference. But we, we, ha we, we have learned a lot, uh, and we need to keep learning. I think now, I'm proud to say that the, uh, certainly my own organization has made the rights of women central central uh, to, uh, to its work on human rights. Yeah, and I would just add, uh, you know, where the UN is on the ground dealing with this, whether it's UNICEF or, or UNFPA, the Population Fund, or UNIFEM, the, the approach is actually a, a very holistic one, where they're trying to uh, keep the girls in school and take care of all the other issues that change both the culture of the community and the girl's own aspirations for her life, and is in, in, in effect empowering her. But the cutting takes place at such an early age. You, you have to deal with them, the mothers and the fathers and the whole community. So the girl doesn't become an advocate for herself until it's too late. I find it interesting that you know there's roughly 28 countries in which it's prevalent still. 19 of them have laws against it. It is criminal, criminalized in those countries. But that's only half, and even in those countries, we're still fighting this battle. So there is a rule of law problem here that I'm sure you're dealing with as well, that it, 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 that's not the only answer, obviously. It, you, need, you need these groups in there trying to change the, the culture yeah. at, the, at the group And it's also important level. to point out that it's, it's not a problem that's just confined right. uh, to Africa. Or, I mean, it's now around the world. It's in Europe. It's in the United States. Uh, and uh, that even makes it even more complicated to talk about how you're going to uh, to, uh, to stop it. Um. Well, actually, that goes to um, a, a question here, uh, Rob, from uh, Luz, which I think is in the UK, um, um, uh, asks, uh, you and others have talked about the need to stop FGM within a generation. Do you really think you can do it? Kathy? Well, there's a goal that the UN has set to eliminate it by 2015, which is the date for the Millennium Development Goals. I don't think there's any reason we shouldn't be trying for that. That's, that's far enough away that we could really do a concerted effort. And frankly, it's going to take an, a, a global campaign. You know, we need a global campaign for girls. This ought to be right front and center at the beginning of it. So I think it's doable. There's a, I mean, there may be a parallel with China in that uh, foot binding existed for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years, um, and at various points, I think in the Qianlong uh, Emperor, uh, or no, uh, some, uh, um, it may have been before Qianlong, but the, that foot binding was actually uh, punishable by exile on the part of the parents, it had zero effect. I mean, at various points it was banned, no impact. And then um, early in the 20th century, really remarkably quickly, uh, it disappeared, and it went from a perception on the part of parents that if they didn't bind their daughter's feet, that it'd be hard for her to marry, to a perception that if they bound her feet, it'd be harder for her to get married. And um, um, it, you know, I guess the, the question one is... Emperor, yeah? One emperor changed the rule, changed the perception. It was really a, a bottom-up social movement. It um, uh, led, by, led by elites uh, from within the country, um, uh, part of this sense of awakening um, and supported by outsiders to some degree, but but really led from within, pushed from within. Um, so I guess the you know the, the question is how we can replicate that and whether groups like Tostan are indeed whether this is the next um, sort of foot binding analogy, so that the change once it comes 
you reach a tipping point, it happens very, very quickly. I, I just want to come back to that point Kathy made at 2015. Um, I wish I shared your optimism, Kathy. I just um, feel that we're here talking about solutions. We seem to know what works. We know this model is there. Uh, we know about the respect we have to give to communities. Um, and many, many local NGOs and civil society organizations are working on the ground. Um, and, you know, to pay tribute to all of those small organizations, really at danger as well. One of the women who's contacted me through this campaign, Lucy Mashua, who said, you know, go forth and speak at Davos about this. Um, and her story, once she started speaking out within her community, she was raped, she was beaten, she was tied to a tree, she was jailed. Um, she's luckily living now in the US. Um, but I think what we need to see is how we can, in the next five years, if that is true, take this to scale. I'm, I'm using the language of Davos there. Um, but really, you know, what is preventing us? If we know how to make things change, um, why can't we put this into place? Is it a funding issue? Is it a global awareness issue? What, what needs to happen? What are the levers that we can pull? If we were sitting here saying, actually, this is too intractable, this is too difficult, um, we're not going to address this issue, fair enough. But we're all sitting here in vehement agreement that this is a severe human rights abuse, a child rights abuse, a women's rights abuse. We've got a solution. What can we do? A bunch of people from on YouTube ask variations of that, that what... You know, what have we learned from, um, uh, from, well, one person asked what we can learn from HIV campaigns that can be transposed into working to eradicate FGM. Uh, various other people ask, you know, variations of that. But, and given what you talked about earlier, isn't indeed one lesson perhaps that uh, a bunch of outsiders at the treetops, the top-down efforts are, on their own aren't going to get very far and that what does work is... Uh, outsiders supporting indigenous efforts from within the culture uh, and giving them the microphone and and us standing back and, and letting them lead the way? I mean, is that is that part of it? Well, I absolutely think it's part of it. I, I think that if you can't change the norms, the practices of communities unless you listen and understand and have a dialogue, and again, the toast stand approach did exactly that. Listen to the why, listen to the perceptions, and then also gave information about the health effects, the facts. I think that's one of the things that we haven't done enough of as an international community around a number of these issues. And you mentioned HIV AIDS. You know, one of the most difficult things we've gotten better coverage of prevention of mother-to-child transmission, of treatment of AIDS generally, of treatment of pediatric AIDS. One of the most difficult things has been to understand really how to have an impact with education. Um, it just hasn't seemed to work. And part of it is I don't think we understand and listen to communities enough. For example, um, you know, one of the things that you talk about in the Southern Africa where AIDS is most prevalent is use of condoms. But there are practices in places like Swaziland where in order to get married, you have to get pregnant first to show your fertility. Well, it's a little difficult to talk about using condoms when you want to get pregnant. And so I think if you don't listen to the community and understand the whys, the, how the practices work, and what's going on truly in the communities, and have a dialogue about it, you can't actually make the change. And I think this, this human rights approach, engaging the community in human rights, in women's rights, in men and women understanding each other and why things are happening, is a way to really make an impact in changing some of these practices, particularly those that are most harmful for women. Larry, if I could just, yeah. uh, I, because I don't want to create a sort of uh, dichotomy between the approach that you just described, which I, I fully support, and the idea of outside pressure, because that can lead to a kind of paralysis on the part of people who aren't able 
uh, to have a dialogue with the community. And I think the lesson, not only on this issue, but on many, many other issues, is, is as Julia said, you need a multi-level or multi-faceted kind of approach. Uh, because I think, to take your China example, which is really fascinating, which I, I want to like learn to use more, there was also very, very strong uh, political will on the part of the government that played a major role, I think, uh, as I understand it. Um, uh, at least I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I the actually, ideology. I think at previous points there was a central political will that actually didn't really get anywhere. And at the time when uh, foot binding really ended up being eradicated, you had very weak um, central governments that right. I was thinking that it was really after the after the revolution, but you, it happened it, before. Well, it began happening uh, before in the in the end of the Qing Dynasty, and then and then after that, in a period when um, you had real social awakening, but pretty fragile central governments. Well, anyway, uh, my point is that I think you need to put, we need to put pressure on governments to not simply pass laws, which is the easy thing to do, uh, but to actually uh, not, in, not allow the kinds of practices that Julia talked about. I mean, it's, you know, uh, where people are being threatened, people are, lives are in danger. You need, uh, the, the outside world needs to be in support in a very practical way. Of, of people who are speaking out um, and who are being threatened as a result of being spe uh, speaking out on, on this issue as well as on other women's rights issues. So I, I don't think it's an either or thing. I think that we need very much to correct what I think uh, is a longstanding failure to, to appreciate the community approach. But I also think we still need to keep uh, and general public Well, awareness. let me uh, press you on that a little further since you have an, a, a Y chromosome here. And uh, I think there be you know, some men watching, uh, whether here or on YouTube, who will think, hey, you know, <laughs> this isn't my fight. Um, I don't have a clitoris. Um, and, what, and, and the same thing, I think, applies to a lot of other women's rights issues. Um, what do you say to them? Is this their fight or not? Oh, it absolutely is their fight. If they care at all about, uh, you know, uh, human rights, about their own freedom and their own dignity, I mean, I think uh, that 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 was my point about the linkage between the fight for women's rights and the fight for all human rights. I mean, it, it's not we all can very easily uh, draw the draw the connections uh, between the status of women uh, in any particular society and the general status of human rights in that society, and that includes the societies in which many of the people who are watching this this uh, uh, discussion uh, live. Um, insofar as, and, and it's the experience of my own, uh, my own life and my own, my own organization, uh, that it was the struggle of, uh, of uh, women for their rights that made us understand our own, uh, our own rights and, and the way things are connected and, and uh, the way that the approach we were taking was a very narrow and very limited approach. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's in the vital interest of every man. Uh, and we, of course, don't live in isolation from women. Uh, you know, we, we have daughters, we have wives, we have lovers, we, we you know, I, it's inconceivable to me that someone could say, this is not of any interest to me because I'm, a, I'm male and this happens to women, any more than I would expect women to say, I'm not really interested in what happened to Nelson Mandela because he was a man and I'm a woman. I mean, what kind of world is that where we suddenly divide our, our feelings about? Maybe one way or, of thinking of it is that um, the Holocaust at the end of the day wasn't a Jewish issue, civil rights weren't a black issue, and FGM isn't just a women's issue. Right, exactly. And I think particularly um, men pay such a huge part in the communities that practice this, as Anna said, because one of the key reasons for FGM being in place is it makes a girl marriageable. And when, as part of these community conversations, the men come together and decide that they will marry an uncut woman, this is how it changes within a generation. And you then move to the next community, which is the intramarrying group. So men are so vital in this debate, and particularly as, as religious leaders as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think when we focus on rights, we get stuck. When we focus on economics, which is really what this all comes down to, is kind of what's a girl worth, and is this about marrying her for her value? 
it changes. I think because it's girls, people do react differently than women. So I think that's going to help bring more people to the issue. <laughs> We've used economic incentives in a number of cases to get communities to think differently about early marriage. And the consequence of the man finally having a reason to stop and think about his daughter marrying early or marrying late when there's an economic incentive to do so. And in the case in Ethiopia, a girl who stays in school is eligible for a sheep or a goat for her family if she stays in school two more years. The fathers have been saying, hmm, I wasn't really in the conversation before. I had no reason to have the conversation. I had no reason to think about it. I had no reason to think about the value my daughter could bring to my family if she stayed in school longer. The economic incentive got him to pay attention. So I, I'm for the hybrid solution, which is the community listening, incentives where, where, we can, where we can apply them. And I know not everybody loves incentives, but I think they do work, and, and the external um, pressure, but I think rights sometimes gets people into a different kind of conversation where they they have a different view of rights. Well, speaking of a different kind of conversation, now we've been, I mean, we've been discussing this at one level, but I want to kind of make it real. And we have a video clip uh, from Molly, um, and I have not yet seen it. I'm briefed that everybody in the history of the world who's ever seen it has promptly burst into tears afterward. And so pull out your handkerchiefs. Um, but uh, if we can roll uh, that uh, video, that'd be great. goes on a zillion times a day in, uh, in much of the world. And um, I, I don't know exactly what kind of uh, cutting this was, but it uh, did not appear to be infibulation, which is the much worse kind. And in that case, the girl's legs are uh, afterward uh, often tied uh, together and um, for a couple of weeks or so, so the wound can heal um, and uh, is is that squared. Um, Jennifer, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jane from the UK asks, how can women fight GM in cultures where they have no voice? And um, likewise, Sam from Devon says, FGM seems to be about what women in some cultures believe they must do and be to have value to the men who hold power. If we're to change the thinking of men and women in these cultures, what can we draw on from our own experience to guide us? And let me put out this, frame that to the panel. I mean, I think there's a perception that this is often really about men oppressing women. And it seems to me at least that it's much more complicated than that. And that typically this is uh, what women in fact are doing to other women, that the men, uh, they may want to marry a girl who's cut, but they're largely removed from the decision-making. And in fact, partly because men are more likely to be educated, they 
seems quite plausible to me that that men are uh, more likely to be against FGM than women are in these countries. I, I don't know any survey, but that anecdotally, I, w I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. So I wonder if the problem, you know, isn't often patriarchal values, even misogynistic values that are absorbed and transmitted as much by women as by men. You know, if that isn't a better way of looking at this than men oppressing women. Well, and the video just showed women are the primary carriers of the culture. I mean, Anne, you, you've probably, because you've seen it, you know that that's, that is the way it's passed on. And you may have a point of view on that, but th that's how it, it is carried in the community. Well, I think that, I mean, certainly that clip um, showed that it is practiced. I mean, when it's actually done, it's, it's women who cut the girls. Um, and, uh, but yet it is the men who were saying my daughter will not be able to get married if she's not cut. So I think it's, it's a practice, it's a culture that has to be addressed as a whole. Not, it's not just women, it's not just men, it's everybody's responsibility to kind of look at how this is going to change. Now, having said that, it is not the same, it's not practiced the same in every country. I went uh, a year before last to Sierra Leone. I was reading my briefing papers and I find out female genital cutting is quite prevalent in Sierra Leone. So I call up Molly Melching who founded Toastan and I said, what are you doing in Sierra Leone? She said, we're not because it's completely different. They practice something called secret societies. And secret societies are where girls would go before there was an education system. They would go off for maybe a few months at a time and they would learn how to be a wife. They'd learn how to, all of these different things. This was their education. And part of it was they got cut. Now, those secret societies still exist in Sierra Leone and still a number of young girls get cut, although less and less. And the secret societies are much less about going for a long period of time and more just about cutting now. But one of the things I found when I was there is that young teenage girls who were still in school were talking about these secret societies and these practices as things that they were going to try to help be a part of the past. And so I think there is some ability to engage in some of these kinds of communities. Again, the practices are different. And in that country, it's, it's, it's done in a completely different way. So I think, again, it's about listening, it's about learning. Learning about the particular culture and practices of a country and the history of it, I think, is key to finding the way to eliminate it. Well, speaking of culture and practices, I mean, one other layer of complexity here is, frankly, religion, that there, um, and I want to be very clear here, a um, uh, uh, great part of the Muslim world does not practice cutting. There's nothing in the Quran about cutting. Um, in the Arabian Peninsula, almost nobody uh, does any cutting. Uh, and there are also uh, a number of Christian places, Ethiopia in particular, uh, that in fact, in Ethiopia, uh, Christians do some of the most severe cutting. All that said, uh, most of the cutting occurs in Muslim countries, whether that is in Africa or in Asia. And doesn't that, I mean, <laughs> given the problems right now between the West and the Muslim world, doesn't that create one more um, layer of complexity if you have uh, Western efforts to go against a practice that is disproportionately embedded in the Muslim world, and um, I don't know who I want to hand this nice <laughs> this this uh, potato to, but uh, can you <laughs> pass can it on. Can I? Can well, I? I Larry yeah. does, uh, you must have to face that a lot. Right. Can I uh, turn it around and just say Mauritania has just issued a, a fatwa against FGM. Thirty-four Islamic leaders have actually just said that. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, as you say, absolutely not in the Quran and, and not an issue. 
um, I hate to address the positives in the debate, but um, you know that there is change, and, and at least if we know that this is one of the key issues, at, le at least we can begin to address it. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's changed also that we, we need to not keep acting as if it hasn't changed is that you know human rights issues at least are no longer a concern of the West somehow. The human rights movement is no longer located in the West. Uh, it's everywhere. Uh, there are human rights organizations, there are thousands of human rights organizations in virtually every region and in the Muslim world, there are incredible uh, organizations and fighters for human rights. And I think what has to shift is that we need to see, and this is something that my organization has to struggle with, is how do we shift our role from being sort of you know, the saviors of the world, that savior paradigm, to a role of like really empowering and trying to help and listen to those organizations in those cultures who are fighting. There is a, an incredible struggle, which we often don't publicize very much, we don't write about it very much, we act as if it's not there, within uh, Islam, within the Muslim world, uh, on these issues, on what it means. And, and that's the struggle, I think, which is ultimately going to determine uh, the success uh, uh, for the reasons we gave about when human rights succeed, it's because they're rooted uh, in the, the indigenous struggle in, in the culture. And that's what I think is the hope uh, for this, that it's a, becoming a global issue, not a Western issue being imposed on the part of the world that carries it out, which was the, the model decades ago. Marian from Germany asks, what do you think should be the punishment levied by the international community for nations that permit FGM? Um, now, I don't, I, my hunch is that probably none of you think that countries as such should be uh, punished, but why not? What, I mean, are there levers that we can apply to countries to take this issue more seriously, or would that create a backlash that would be unhelpful? It, it's already there in the Maputo Protocol, which has been signed up to by many African states, but not yet ratified. So absolutely, we have a role to play as an international community to get some of these issues enshrined in law. And, uh, you know, we had a conversation about CEDAW, the elimination of... Dis dis Sorry, the Commission for the Elimination Against Discrimination Against Women. Trips off the tongue. Um, you know, <laughs> and all of these levers do play an important part, I think, and we, we need to keep the pressure up to ensure that they're ratified. CEDAW has been, of course, passed by, I don't know, 100 and I don't know how many countries, uh, uh, and one of the very few that has not passed it is the U.S. Um, um, let me uh, open this up more broadly. Uh, there are folks here, we have a microphone. And um, so uh, if actually, uh, if you could just hand the microphone to uh, somebody there, that'd be great. And yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Michelle from San Francisco. And I'm, I I'm one of the many volunteers with V-Day. And um, I'm also in a doctoral program in international human rights education in San Francisco. So I wrote a paper last year on FGM. And in the literature, I noticed that um, one of the reasons why the women are continuing the cutting is because it's one of it's their means of economic sustainability. So I was wondering, given that it's the economic forum, what public-private sector partnerships have been built in, if there are any subsidy, subsidies that governments might be giving to women to help them transition from this profession, um, and what means or, and what else we can do as civil civil society actors to help move that forward, and also in terms of leveraging um, some of the um, new media technologies like Kiva.org and Women for Women International and Donors Choose, like what we can do to help move that forward. So. Does anybody want to uh, take a uh, I'll, swing I'll, at that? I'll you know, I, th we've been trying to move the issue of girls actually up on the agenda of Davos and have had been fairly successful, had a very good session yesterday about girls and trying to look at the actors, government, nonprofits, and business, and there's a role for each. Um, we've actually just created a girl fund to help support uh, with private sector money as well as government money, work in communities to give girls more rights, keep them in school, give them access to health and freedom from these uh, from sexual violence or some of these other causes. So I think increasingly, if we get more players who are educated about this and, and are engaged in it, the money does talk, and in, in, you know that will be an, an important piece of changing the way the culture works. And I've, I mean, to what Julia said earlier, I think. The communities need to see that 
th this is part and parcel of what it will take for them to grow and to become a modern a modern area. So I absolutely think you're right that we've we've got to make this a part of the work that all the, of the communities are doing. So when the U.S. puts money into these communities, this is one of the things they're checking for. I would just also add that um, in, not in Senegal, but in most other uh, places, the person who does the cutting is the, is the traditional birth attendant, the traditional midwife. And one, uh, there has to be a much broader effort to address maternal health. I mean, there's this, uh, it's a scandal that more than half a million women die a year in childbirth mm -hmm. unnecessarily, and partly that is because there has been a broad and essentially failed effort to improve maternal health through traditional birth attendants. It did not work, and now I think we're all realizing that. But as we gear up a newer system to improve maternal health based on uh, people who uh, actually have much better training, who can refer to hospitals, uh, who bring people to clinics, um, um, real midwives, then I think it's plausible that those people will then have influence in those communities over reproductive health, and it will go away from these traditional, these dia who are the ones who were doing the cutting. You know, what I, sorry, what I find quite shocking about um, the FGM arena is the fact that 140 million women are living with the consequence of FGM, and um, they appear to be missing from things like the maternal mortality debate, from the, the child death, all of the MDGs that this addresses. And the continuum of care that is needed for these women in particular. Um, and yet, there's so much happening within this field. And everywhere I look, FGM always seems to be missing. And um, I think e exactly as you say, all of these instruments can come into play. Um, and in a way, what we need to do is to be focusing on a, a plethora of solutions that, that can help bring this back into the mainstream, really. If I might just pick up on, um, on the whole issue of maternal health and these issues. Uh, you know, we had a, a little film about Mali and the prevalence of female gen genital cutting in Mali. But in many of these countries, there's also a very high incidence, along with female genital cutting, of early marriage. And the two issues combined, we know that the, the risks to maternal health are greater with women who have been cut. We also know that a, that a girl who is under the age of 15 who gives birth is five, has a five times greater chance of dying in childbirth. And so uh, when I was, Molly was my last field trip as a matter of fact, just in November, and I had very interesting conversations with the health minister about his responsibility to address the issues of early marriage and female genital cutting because they truly are issues with health consequences to women and affect the maternal health and mortality issues. I mean, Kathy, let me just follow up on that. Given the success of this grassroots kind of toe-stand model of education discussion leading to um, addressing FGM, can that same model then be applied to the whole planet play of other issues of getting, keeping girls from dropping out of school, preventing child marriage, uh, various reproductive health questions, including uh, family planning? I mean, is, is this bottom-up grassroots um, supporting local actors model, is that something that ha can be used against a whole variety of other uh, threats to the well-being of girls around the world. Oh, I mean, I, I think that's the only way it can happen. I, I think when we've tried to do things like let's just focus on education or just focus on health, we're not nearly successful because we're not dealing with the underlying issue of the girl's value. So if you put them all together, economic empowerment, education, health, especially the access to this kind of health care and reproductive rights, then you're really dealing with a, a whole change mechanism that can make a big difference. But it, it really has to be that. And luckily, the UN has a five-point approach to girls, and that's the way they do it. And, and I think increasingly, we will all adopt that kind of a holistic, to your word, holistic approach. Ron Freeman, Troika Dialogue, Moscow. Uh, Madam uh, Lala Maharaj mentioned in Mauritania a collective fatwa against FGM. 
I wonder if we could get a few more facts about what led to that and whether it has any mm. mileage, so to speak. Yeah. It's a very good question that I'm afraid I can't answer. I know the headline um, that, that this is, has happened in literally the last two weeks. Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I don't know the backstory, but um, I will find out and post it on my blog at endfgmnow.org. I do know that there has been a real effort by some of the community organizers to get um, Muslim clerics uh, organized in this effort because there is a perception on the part of many ordinary people that this is religious, that this is their religion. And um, so when you get imams saying, no, no, they don't do this in Saudi Arabia, they don't do nothing in the Quran, that, that then that actually has uh, a tremendous amount of, of authority and so, I, I, that has been one reason for trying to get these these fatwas. And uh, if you can, yeah, pass the microphone. Uh, for a young global leader, and actually I come from the Muslim world. And this is why I wanted to kind of to interfere and to give the comment. In fact, something like this is totally pro prohibited in the Muslim world. And uh, just kind of to rephrase Christoph's question, I would assume it's more culturally than it's religiously. So this is more actually instead of saying that it's Islam. So that's kind of the first layer to, to really acknowledge it. And I really respect the uh, yani, uh, Venom man uh, by mentioning that the first lady in Egypt stood out and acknowledged that this is totally against our, let's say, or their um, traditions, the, the religion, and all the, let's say, the social intrinsic values that we were raised up through. Now, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, my, my, my own analysis. It's only a, com a comment, so allow me to take some time. Please, please well, it, well please just wanted to, have to a raise question. This. No, there's no question. Just wanted to clarify that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jim Breyer. I'm a venture capitalist with Axel Partners in Palo Alto, and I've been on the board of Facebook, an investor in Facebook, for about five years. Uh, What's your next investment? Uh, well, we have, a, uh, we, we have about a dozen investments in social media companies uh, around the world. And, and Julia, and for any other panelists that might be interested, what can we as either business investors or part of the business community around social media do better to further many of these causes that we've talked about today? I'm going to talk to you afterwards one-on-one -on -one because <laughs> <laughs> I need your advice. I mean, absolutely. I was, I was talking with someone uh, just the other day about how he uses uh, mobile phones to get medicines <coughs> into villages uh, and able to predict supply and demand in, in a much, much clearer way. And having been out in Africa, knowing the, the, the growing use of that sort of technology is absolutely crucial. I mean, imagine if this network of, as we said before, taking things to scale, imagine if we can do that through empowering community leaders to, you know, even if it's someone saying, I know that there's a cutting ceremony that's due to take place within two months. Um, and then being able to gear up around that. I think there's so much that can be done. And, and the, the empowerment around that is huge. But also, what I found through my experience is how many people have contacted me globally. So this is not just about what the West can do. I had so many emails from people in Cameroon, in Guinea, in all sorts of places saying, what can I do in my own community? And one thought is um, just about, you know, there's not one database, for example, that uh, someone contacted me from um, Guinea-Bissau to say, can I download from the web? I'm about to teach this class. What can I download from the web? I couldn't find a single place where that person could just go to be able to say to their community, these are the issues that you could deal with. So we need to hit this straight on. Let can me I just add something there vis-a-vis -vis what Julia has done. I mean, that, frankly, one of the problems is that we in the news media tend to drop the ball on these kinds of issues, that what we do, we tend to cover what happened yesterday. We tend not to cover what happens every day. And whether it's public health issues, whether it's this kind of daily um, human rights abuse, uh, 
it just falls through the cracks. And since we don't, since we in the media tend to be the ones who help shape the agenda, and since we drop the ball on these kinds of issues, that leaves it, frankly, to people like Julia to uh, bring it up on the agenda. And I really salute you for having done that uh, at Davos. And I think that that is a model for a whole range of other issues, whether it's malaria or I mean, that, anything else, that um, you know, this is our greatest weakness. We are not good at covering things that happen every day. We blow it on those issues. And you've got to raise those and poke us and kind of hold our feet to the fire so that we actually do a better job of covering these incredibly important issues that are ongoing and part of the backdrop and get ignored as a result. If I might just talk, talk a little bit about, um, you, you talked about the use of cell phones for everything from monitoring nutrition to health, and UNICEF's doing a lot of this work. But we also support TOSTAN extensively. And one of the ideas of TOSTAN has been that these communities that have become TOSTAN communities, eliminating the practice through this community-based approach, suddenly they begin to see cell phones in these communities, particularly owned by women. And yet most of the women are illiterate. So they've now started in some of the TOSTAN communities a texting for literacy program where they're teaching women how to read because it's so much cheaper to text than talk in Africa, unlike the US. And so I would challenge the tech community to say, how do we take the next leap forward, recognizing that many of these communities that practice these cultures are now in to the cell community as well? I think there's a question back there. Yeah, my name is Richard. I run an international NGO that works on aging in the developing world. And firstly, I opt my NGO and our partners over 70 countries to, to play a role. A, older people in many of the countries are connected to this particular practice, and maybe we can actually do something constructive, and maybe a, a coalition needs to be built. But I think one of the most striking things for me is about voice. I mean, it is important. I can't remember the name of the Somali uh, model that wrote her autobiography what about her life. But I think the more that that happens, the more that voice can be heard at the national level, and that actually women who have had to bear this are able to have the courage to speak. And using Facebook, you know, that maybe there are ways uh, to enable voice to be heard. I think that that will be transformational. And I don't know quite know how we do that, but it's a, maybe a, a useful strategy. If you, uh, I just want to kind of minimize time going around, so if you hand it to somebody who's near you, <laughs> yeah. Hello, I'm from Switzerland, Isabel Schau. And I just wanted to ask, what kind of programs do we have to empower mothers who have been cut? They say they need to do it for the daughters, but how can we empower them to educate their sons not to marry a cut girl? Because then if the expectation is not there anymore, maybe the girls won't undergo this. Part of the model that we're all saying Tostan, you know, in fact, a number of local civil society organizations are uh, also implementing this model. Um, part of that is that as well as having conversations with the women, you, of course, have conversations with the, the men. Um, and, uh, of course, mothers are talking with their sons um, as, as part of this, but the whole community is coming together. So... The hope is is that that everyone all at once uh, does come to a shift in awareness about the practice. Um, I think we'll have one more uh, question, and then we're going to go through and um, really talk about where we go from here and what specifically somebody who is you know horrified by what what we actually do. But first. Your question. Uh, thank you. Mina al -Arabi. I work with the Sharq al-Awsat newspaper, and I'm also a young global leader. I just wanted to ask you, in terms of getting spokespeople from communities that have given up um, female genital mutilation to go to communities that haven't yet, I mean, I'm sure you've had some experience of this, but if we can take that to a greater scale, if there's funding for such project to facilitate their travel, because I think that's the best way to get the message out, to say that we used to do it, and we've given up, and these are the benefits, is probably the best um, person with credibility, because often with these issues, it's about credibility, and I think it's wonderful 
have you raised that this is not an issue for Muslims or that Islam is the one calling for this? And I think that breaks away the taboo because if you tell Muslims, and I am one of them, that this is not to say that just because you're a Muslim, we think that you're a bad person doing this. On the contrary, there is an appreciation that this is not something that the Quran dictates, but sadly there are those that toast the religion on so many different levels. Um, so I salute the way you've approached it. Um, I know that when people, um, you know, have been making this point, the fact that Saudi Arabia does not, that there's no, that there is not cutting in Saudi Arabia, that, that is one of the things that is always emphasized and one of the things that has the greatest, um, you know, the surprise to people has the greatest authority. Um, I don't know of any cases, I don't know if anybody else does, of, you know, people, envoys being sent, clerics from Saudi Arabia, for example, to communities mm -hmm. in these countries to say, you know, you've got it wrong. Um, um, but, I mean, in fact, there, in my experience, invariably, in every country, there are voices from within that country who are saying, this is ridiculous, this is not, uh, and, and so, you know, and to the extent those people speak the language and have local um, credibility and authority. Um, so, sorry, very, very quickly, but just, I mean, the communities that did used to practice it, that's what I mean, like you mentioned yeah. in Senegal or Mauritania, where there's a community that it was, I mean, recently actually practiced and then given up, because I think that's the most um, uh, credible voice. Yeah. yeah, no, very good point. I want to now um, kind of wind up, and uh, for those who didn't get a chance to ask uh, your questions, you know, feel free to mob the folks here afterward. Um, <laughs> and, um, but... You know, we've been talking about something that happens, three million girls a year. Human rights violation, I think we agree, on a vast scale, um, leads to more maternal mortality, leads to more girls dying of infection, uh, at a scale, we, and we don't really know. When a girl dies after she's been cut, uh, people just say, oh, she died of malaria. It's, it's people don't acknowledge uh, how often this happens. But what do we do? Somebody is here, wants to get involved, somebody's watching on YouTube, um, they can go to the Toastan website, which is toastan.org, T-O-S-T-A-N.org, uh, and learn more about it in that way. Um, they can go to Julia's website, um, and I'll, I'll, I don't know, I'm sure... Which is endfgmnow.org, but also another excellent website is uh, forwarduk.org.uk which is where I volunteer as well. well. Let me sort of, let's go systematically through here. Maybe Kathy, if you can start. And you know, what, what does somebody do? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's awesome that, this, uh, that the YouTube community chose this issue and already has stood up for it. So having a voice is the first thing. Uh, the second is to become an advocate for girls. If you haven't seen the Girl Effect video, which is on YouTube, it's, it's an awesome thing. And I think it gives you the sense of the positive that if you can become an advocate for girls, we can end some of these uh, troublesome things. I think you had a great idea, which is instead of shame and blame, we ought to be finding those who've already begun to fight back. And, you know, we all probably need to do a better job of thanking Uganda for just making the, the thing uh, against the law right now. So I think we all have voices and we should be using them more. And, and um, we've got the tools now. Well, first of all, I think uh, it's clear to everybody that this is part of a, a, a larger struggle for, for women's rights in general. And and I think, uh, and, and I'm happy to be agreeing with Nick on this, that this is a particular moment in history where this battle really is ripe, uh, can really be, there can be a sea change I I in the world. Uh, I think FGM is part of that issue. I don't think it's the only one, but it's, it's a continuum of how we raise the status of women and how we just make intolerable practices that have seemed tolerable. So that's the first thing. And there's myriad ways for people to get involved. And it's not only a question of the West against the, the developing world. It, it's also a question of the, f the fight within uh, each country uh, where, where these issues are still involved. So I think that's the first thing. And the second thing is that uh, Amnesty is involved right now in a campaign uh, in Europe uh, to, to try to change the practices and policies of the European Union to make sure that they're supporting the kind of approaches that we've talked about here. It's very easy for people to get 
involved in that. They can Google their or their local uh, amnesty website for the, whatever country they're in, uh, and also to make sure that that women who are trying to to uh, get refuge uh, in this country or in countries in Europe uh, because they have a legitimate fear uh, of being forced uh, to be cut, uh, that the laws are changed to make that possible for them to do. And Julia, in case anybody doesn't have your website down yet. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly the website, but I, what I really think we need to do is make FGM much more explicit. Um, the data, the paucity of the data is shocking. Um, there is a, a lot that's out there, but how can we ascertain the global scale of this issue if we don't actually know what we're dealing with? The three million figure we're all quoting is in Africa alone. It doesn't tackle Indonesia, Yemen, UAE. It doesn't tackle Europe, where we know 500,000 women are living with FGM. So we don't understand the scale. We don't understand what needs to be done on a country by country basis to tackle the problem. A solution in Indonesia is completely different to what we need in Cameroon, in Sierra Leone, as Anna said, as in Senegal. We need to be very, very cognizant of what is the, the global action plan. Without that, we can't cost a solution. If this is a matter of resources, then great, let's just get on and fundraise. But until we are much more aware about the global scale of this problem and what needs to be done about it, we can't reach that target of 2015. I think a um, very kind offer from an NGO already working in this field. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Um, but equally, all the NGOs working in this area, please get FGM on your agenda. Do something more about it. Um, and I've run out of steam. Go to my website. There are five easy <laughs> things uh, that you can do there. They may seem little things. Um, but lastly, do what you can. This is going out to the YouTube community. There'll be people watching all over the world. I chose to enter a competition on Davos. You may want to find out what is happening in your local community. You may wish to fundraise. You may wish to push your government on various things or your MP. Know what your action is and what your agency is, and please just do something. It's International FGM Day. Sorry, International Anti-FGM Day on the 6th of February. That's a week today. Contact a, a journalist. Talk about FGM. Thank you. Don't feel free to contact. I mean, don't feel you have to contact this journalist in particular. Uh, I'm already on board. Um, uh, Anne. Well, I, certainly I would agree with all that's been said. Um, but I think it's, first of all, so important to recognize that this is, first and foremost, a violation of the rights of the girl child. Think about the fact that most of the people, the children who are subjected to this, are between about the ages of four and maybe 12. I mean, this is a human being that really doesn't have the right to say no. It's imposed on her. The second thing I would say is that everyone should look at those organizations that are working in this arena. It isn't a popular cause. These organizations can't generate lots of resources for their work, and so support those organizations that are truly making a difference in this area. Um, let me just also say, finally, that you know this is indeed just part of a broader puzzle, and, and that quite aside from the simple moral issue, it's an eminently practical issue that we're not going to make progress against global poverty, uh, against insecurity, unless girls are brought into the picture, brought into the formal economy, educated, and so on. This is one facet of that larger picture. And then we really hope uh, that uh, you, whether you're here, right here, or watching on YouTube, will get engaged. And uh, I think Julia uh, really uh, deserves our thanks and appreciation for uh, bringing this issue to Davos and to YouTube, to the Davos debate. And please join me in thanking her and all the panelists here today.